Are you a fan of Bravo's hit series that follows the crew and guests aboard those Instagram-worthy mega yachts? Then you'll love this behind-the-scenes glimpse at how the show is made. This is the untold truth of Below Deck Mediterranean. In June 2019, The Washington Post reported on the inner workings of Below Deck and Below Deck Mediterranean, explaining how the charters on TV's most famous yachts work. The outlet reported, Below Deck and Below Deck Mediterranean center on a season's worth of three-day excursions purchased by charter guests who receive a significant discount, still costing a group anywhere from $35,000 to $75,000, according to yachting industry estimates, in exchange for turning their vacation into a busy TV production. Alongside any salaries the crew members receive, which are likely to be in line with yachting industry standards, tipping is expected. Reporting on published rates for one of the vessels featured on Below Deck Mediterranean, Bustle claimed, since chartering the Ionian Princess starts at $167,000 per week, that means even for a one-week charter, the crew can expect to share another $8,350 to $25,050. Now that tip isn't bad for a week's work. If you've ever thought that the Below Deck Mediterranean yacht looked a little cramped at times, that's because it was. According to Chief Stu Hannah Ferrier, the boats featured on the show simply weren't designed to hold all of the people that make the TV show happen. She told Forbes, The difference with having a film crew is that there are fingerprints everywhere. There are 30 or 40 extra people stepping on and off every day. Basically, all of the extra bodies make a ton of extra work for the stews. Fans of the show will have noticed the camera operators breaking the fourth wall occasionally, when a staff member or guest is in trouble, for instance. We had to make a decision, like, do I drop my camera and save this person's life? And then there's a very strict fourth wall rule, which he chose to break, and I think we're all glad that he did. According to Farrier, there have been plenty of times when members of the crew can't help but come into contact with production staff. As she told Forbes, you find yourself almost hoping you don't have a sexual harassment claim from a camera guy. You're like, my butt is too big to squeeze by without touching him. If you thought the boat's crew looked seriously busy whenever charter guests were on board, that's because they were. Farrier revealed that while the show is filming, she's often so busy that she forgets to eat. She told the cider, People didn't realize that I never eat until I ate, and then they're like, we never see her eat. Season 1, I lost 18 pounds. Season 2 was 12 pounds. Season 3 was about 16 pounds, and this last season I lost about 8 or 9 pounds, but nothing crazy. I lose a lot of weight when I'm filming. There is a plus side to running around so much and for getting to eat, though. Per Farrier, people are like, how do you stay fit on the boat? I'm like, are we watching the same thing? Because all I do all day is run up and down stairs. So yeah, I work out enough. That's what I get paid for. Season 4 of Below Deck Mediterranean served up some not-so-gourmet drama when Chef Mila, a supposedly Le Cordon Bleu-trained chef, didn't exactly deliver on her resume. When Chef Mila began to send out less-than-perfect food and was even caught licking a steak on camera, some viewers were suspicious that she was a plant to boost ratings. Did she lick one of the steaks or something? And when she started to express her seemingly homophobic views on television, cast, crew, and viewers were all horrified. However, Bosa and Joao Franco insisted on Twitter, It's not for ratings. The process we go through is a long one. These are real events that happen, and you never know what people are like until they're already there. We were all as shocked as you after watching this episode. Chief Stu Ferrier replied to a fan who suggested that the chef was a plant. She tweeted, Not sure where you are getting your info from, but it's not correct. There really isn't any way to know if someone is going to be homophobic in a normal job interview, and her CV looked great. She's obviously not great, but it wasn't set up like that. One of the stars of Below Deck Mediterranean's fourth season was Anastasia Sermava, who started out as a third stew but stepped into Chef Mila's role when Mila was fired. And despite doing a great job in the galley, Sermava appears to have left yachting behind altogether since the show stopped filming. Sermava revealed that she's opened an eco-cafe in Sri Lanka with its own yoga studio. The former third stew told Decider, I met my business partner back in July and he was like, when you're done with your boat stuff, can you move to Sri Lanka? And we built it from the ground up. And for anyone worried that Sermava has given up on her culinary dreams, she told The Cider, I'm the executive chef and creative director of this company. Basically, she's putting her skills to great use in her new business. And Sermava seems excited about her business's future plans, as she revealed, We got great reviews, people loved it, and I'm going back in September to finish building everything and then train my staff on the rest of my menu, and staff it with yoga teachers, and rock it. She's on dry land now, but she's still in the high-end vacation business. 
Chef Ben Robinson has appeared on both Below Deck and Below Deck Mediterranean, but Robinson revealed that during his break from the show, he started a business on land and is now hoping to settle down and start a family. He explained to People, I've reached that age where I'm really trying to settle down now in terms of grounding myself with a land-based business. And in turn, I want to find a viable partner who I can maybe marry and have a kid and everything. It's just the toughest job in the world, and I think I've had it really easy on dry land. However, anyone hoping he was still dating Below Deck alum Emily Warburton Adams will sadly be disappointed. Robinson told People, We're friends. Our romance ended and on good terms. Emily is a London girl and very close to her mother. I lived in London for quite a few years and that was a chapter that I was quite happy to close in my life. Although the couple's fledgling relationship came to an end, it sounds as though Robinson might finally be ready to start his own family and leave Below Deck behind for good. <laughs> It might be impossible to imagine Below Deck Mediterranean without Captain Sandy Yawn, but avid fans will remember that the spin-off's first season had a very different lead in the form of Captain Mark Howard. The traditional captain was the opposite of Captain Sandy in many ways, most notably in his much more formal relationship with the crew. It's not cool unless I know about it. However, Chief Stu Hannah Farrier still has fond memories of her former captain. In August 2019, Farrier told The Daily Dish, Captain Mark and I, we send a message maybe once a year, just to touch base. But as for what became of Howard, Farrier is as in the dark as the rest of us. She joked to The Daily Dish, I don't really think I knew what he was up to when I was working with him, let alone three years later. It appears that season one's captain has left the world of reality TV behind him, for now at least. Season 4's Travis caused quite a stir with his on-screen drinking, but the deckhand apparently won't be watching any of his antics anytime soon. How are you going to know you don't like something until we try it? In an interview with the Sydney Morning Herald, Travis revealed, I would never watch reality TV with my time, so watching myself would just be the ultimate waste of time and also mega cringe. However, despite apparently hating the medium on which he's now a star, Travis isn't afraid to connect with fans on social media and has a very active, yet unverified, Instagram account. One of the absolute rays of sunshine on Below Deck Mediterranean has to be Colin Macy O'Toole, whose rapping and general lovely behavior can even make Joao Franco act like a decent human being. But professional musician Macy O'Toole apparently had his doubts about joining the show in the first place. He discussed his first season on the show with TV series Hub and said, The first week I realized I didn't belong. I'm the only one that didn't work on a yacht before, but luckily my crew were great teachers and cared a lot and took time out of their day to teach me something Something new and made me feel really comfortable. But despite gradually getting used to living on a yacht, there was one thing that never improved. He joked, My bed. It was the size and comfortability of a coffee table. While Macy O'Toole downplays his musical abilities, fans have seen him rap on the show. As he told TV series Hub, I've been involved with music since I was five. I'm proficient in piano, saxophone, and vocals. I made three New York State All-State ensembles in high school and earned a bachelor's degree in music education. Throughout season four, the deckhand put his music skills to great use by posting rap recaps on his YouTube channel. Fans of Below Deck Mediterranean likely tracked the budding season three romance between second Stu Brooke Lawton and deckhand Joao Franco, while secretly wishing that Lawton would come to her senses and date Colin Macy O'Toole instead. However, now that Lawton and Franco are no longer together, both seem to have alternate stories about what happened. Franco claimed that Lawton cheated on him, which apparently led to the end of their relationship. I saw texts between them and pictures and stuff, and. She was saying one thing to me, and then she was saying to the guy, oh my god, he's coming to Fort Lauderdale, I'm, I'm done with this. However, Lawton had a very different version of events, telling people, I absolutely did not cheat on him. Lawton opened up to the outlet about the end of the relationship, saying, Although it initially hurt to hear Joao blamed our relationship breakdown on a false claim that I cheated on him, it is very true to his character and allows him some relief for his ego. If this theory makes him sleep easier at night, then so be it. But him saying this only makes me lose even more respect for him. Basically, we may never know who is telling the truth, but it's probably for the best that these two former on-screen lovebirds have now gone their separate ways. Any reality TV show should be viewed with a certain level of scrutiny, but just how real are the events of Below Deck and its Mediterranean spin-off? 
According to one of the show's producers, Mark Cronin, all reality shows are different. There's a spectrum from the very fake to the very real. I think, though, that reality TV tends to be more real than you think. The skeptical audience is giving us too much credit for being masterminds. He also explained, The contract between the cast and me is, please make us a great show that people will love, and please be fair in portraying who we are and what we do. I try to keep to that. However, some guests have been less than pleased with their portrayal on screen. According to one such charter guest, Jesse Bider from Florida, he was cast to play the villain in season one. He told the Sarasota Observer, I didn't mind being the show's villain. The former guest insisted that his role on the show had been produced, claiming, We had a lot of fun, it was a great experience, and it was fun playing a role. He also told the publication, People who know me know this isn't real. As for the truth of the matter, viewers will just have to keep on watching and guessing. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Nicki Swift videos about your favorite favorite TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.